When you're working in these places, we mentioned several of them, you don't get paid. Does that ever bug you to feel you're like you're getting ripped off, you're working for nothing? Oh, I always get paid. I don't know about Dottie and Mulder here, but I've always been paid. I'm making quite a uh, substantial income. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, does, it, does it ever bother you? It never bothered me. You no. accept it. What are you going to do? It's a great, great showcase there. You know, it, both the places around are good because <laughs> this is where the industry is. So hearing that clip, what's your takeaway on that? That they don't <laughs> like if you look at Letterman's sort of uh, 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 kind of body language in that YouTube clip, you look mm -hmm. very uncomfortable when the host of uh, whatever show that was asked him, uh, "You don't get paid." Does that does that ever bother you that you <laughs> don't get paid? What and what for the audience at home? Describe what he was doing, like body wise. Um, he's wearing like seventies clothes, right, and yeah. he just sort okay so. Um, what I learned from covering poker, a tell is uh, when you start touching your face, mm -hmm. when you feel uncomfortable, you know. So he was doing he was doing some tells that uh, he he wasn't happy with 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 the host of, of that show, which is a clip from like a rare clip from I would say like probably about mid mid to like maybe around 77, 1977. Uh, he he didn't like the question uh, posed to him that uh, you know you don't get paid. When you do sets at the comedy store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that leads into um, what we're talking about today is uh, the history of the comedy store strike. So once again, uh, I am Harmon Leon and with me is. I am Scott Colonico, robot from across the pond. And this, in case you want to know, is the podcast Comedy History 101. So today we're going to talk about the history of the uh, – is, is it famous or infamous comedy store strike of 1979? Hmm. I think you could say it would both, both be a little famous and infamous at the same time. If you could be both things, that's what it would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what, what, what uh, the comedy store strike was, uh, it, it was uh, this kind of a turning point in comedy history – where uh, comedy went from being fun and uh, we're practicing our art to that change in stand-up comedy where it was suddenly like a business and comedians should be paid. Right, yeah, as opposed to uh, treating it as a college. I think that was um, the comedy store owner's point, point of, of reference. Yeah, but you got to realize, so early 70s, stand-up comedy, uh, like modern-day stand-up comedy, uh, was sort of reinvented. Like, back before that, it was like comedians in Vegas. It was like the old school, like Buddy Hackett, Don Rickles, Shecky Green. Um, there was clubs like, you know, The Hungry Eye and The Purple Onion, you know, San Francisco. And, and of course, you know, all those great comedy clubs that were like in the... Uh, Greenwich Village. Um, mm -hmm. But this was like a change of the guard because like Mitzi was the first to create like uh, the modern day comedy club. Right. Yeah. And, and um, along the way, kind of uh, as one of the um, comedians there is pointing out, kind of the modern day, the idea of the modern comedy kind of lineup, kind of a rapid fire uh, series of comics going on right one after the other. Yeah, she kind of changed like comedy as we see today. Kind of like uh, she took the model of the strip club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which I feel like when I'm on a bill and there's way too many comedians, <laughs> it, it it gets that feeling. And the comedy store was like perfect for that because I don't know if you've ever been in the comedy store on the Sunset uh, Strip, but it's kind of has that danky, like it's a dark uh, black wall painted fit, uh, place. And it kind of has that strip club sort of feeling. So uh, just backtracking a bit, uh, the comedy store opened in 1972 by old school comedian Sammy Shore. Um, it was a 99 seat room on Sunset Boulevard, and it once housed the uh, legendary club Ciro's. Do you know anything about Ciro's? Apparently, the uh, mob guys used to hang out there. That's, that, uh, that's Bugsy the Siegel. 
Bugs Eagle, somebody was shot in the fr- in front of it. I just saw it. Mo. Oh, really? Somebody? Yeah. Apparently one of the big um, uh, mob dudes was shot right in front. Yeah, so it was like, you know, a place where, like, you would see, like, Liza Minnelli hanging out. Um, kind of like an old school kind of nightclub. Yeah. But 1972, uh, Sammy Shore um, opened the comedy store. And in ni- it's either 1970, she was, and Sammy Shore was married to Mit- Mitzi, Mitzi Shore. That wasn't her maiden name. No, no, that was her. No. <laughs> and she began operating the club in either, I think it was either 1973 or 1974. But basically, Sammy and Mitzi divorced. And instead of paying like higher alimony payment, he just gave her the club and Polly Shore. Because <laughs> that's she, her kid. Yeah, the, he got that in the deal. Or she did. Yeah, so uh, what she did was uh, she officially bought the building in 1976, and she rebuilt the room to focus on the stage, took out the bar. Uh, she made customers order drinks from waitresses, established the club two-drink minimum, and thus, i.e., the modern comedy club was invented. Was clapping. Um, yeah, so the club was ground zero for stand up in the late seventies. Some of the people that got their starts there are uh Jay Leto, David Letterman, Richard Pryor. Well Richard Pryor had to start elsewhere, but he would drop in at the uh at the comedy store every once in a while to work on new material. Uh Robin Williams, Michael Keaton, Jimmy Walker, Richard Lewis, oh my god, my my tongue's already tired. Richard Belcher, <laughs> Elaine Boozler, Paul Mooney, Gary Shanley, and Marsha Wolf Warfield, among others, in addition to uh one of our other uh, pod, podcast co-hosts, uh, Mark Marin, had a brief stint there as the doorman at the uh, comedy store. But yeah, like um, like I said, so stand-up in the early 70s was mostly revolved around two cities. It was like New York, Las Vegas. Um, this club opened up uh, the comedy store, 72. And another big change that changed comedy was um, in May – of that year, uh, Johnny Carson moved The Tonight Show from New York to Burbank. From Hollywood, The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. This is Ed McMahon, along with Doc Severinsen and the NBC Orchestra, inviting you to join Johnny and his guest, Buddy Hackett, John Lithgow, and another segment of Moron Movies. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Here's Johnny. And that also changed the whole dynamic of uh, club comedy at the Comedy Store because in 1973, an unknown Freddie Prince did a spot at the Comedy Store and that won him a spot on The Tonight Show. And because of that, he became uh, the star of Chico and the Man. Cockroaches are strong. You can't kill them. You ever notice? Hey, you step on them, you hear them snap. As soon as you lift your foot, they run like hell. <laughs> That's because they ain't know we believe the snap means they're dead, so they're going, chump, and they're gone. She go in the man with Jack Albertson from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And also was Scatman the man. Crothers from The Shining. Oh, yeah, Scatman was in there, too. Yeah, he was, yeah he's great in The Shining. But he wasn't, in, he wasn't the man. I think that was Jack Albertson, Anderson. Yeah, he wasn't the man. No, he wasn't the man. But he's the man, the man yeah, he's as the... in a uh, cool actor. Yeah, he, he was. <laughs> yes, Freddie Prince, father of um, Freddie Prince Jr. Of yeah, exactly, of exactly. Civil. Yeah, you, one, one interesting thing on to, to shift away from pretty Freddie Prince Jr. for a bit. An interesting thing that uh, people were talking. So yeah, it was kind of like this snowball effect because you had Freddie Prince go up on um, the Tonight Show with Carson, and then Johnny would say, "Oh, by the way, you can see this young man performing at the Comedy Store here in Los Angeles." And so that would just be, you know, people watching this at home who were aspiring comedians would see this and go, "Oh, well, that's the place it need to be is to go." to the comedy store yeah and that was like uh what david letterman said in one of those old uh interview clips Mm -hmm. like he'd be listening back in indiana it's like i want to make it as a comedian and all these comedians that are on the tonight show it sounds like they all perform at the comedy store Mm -hmm. and suddenly it became like that was like the place to go you want if you're a comedian you would do the comedy store with the chance of getting on the Tonight Show, and it's, isn't it like crazy that that was the only show in town, like TV show? Yeah, that was. <laughs> I mean, it, it was like if you're on 
the Tonight Show back in the 70s and, and you kill it and Johnny tells you to come over to the couch, you were like a made man. Yeah, that was that. That was it. Yeah, it was interesting. That was you had, you had the one, the gatekeepers. Yeah, and it was like it was such a gatekeeper. Um, and because of that, uh, so uh, Mitzi saw herself as sort of like a den mother for these inspiring comedians. Uh, she thought of like the comedy store was like a college for comedians, and she thought, you know, which was sort of true that you know, given she's giving these comedians an opportunity to like work on their craft and possibly, you know, get discovered. Uh, she would like, um, you know, make phone calls on behalf of some of the comedians or lend them money. Uh, she took some on vacations with her. That sounds a little dodgy. <laughs> we'll get into <laughs> and, that. I've, I did some research on this. So that's what she thought. She thought, you know, okay, I'm providing this training ground for comedians, but how did things change? Like, Mitzi's goal was to make the main room of the comedy store, like, for Vegas acts like Buddy Hackett. It is very seldom that at a prenuptial dinner, a trunk dick reaches for a potato. <laughs> and the mother said, <clears throat> I don't know what I saw. Could you do that again? <laughs> he said, I could, but I don't know if there's room in my ass for another potato. <laughs> So she thought like the main room would be like this Vegas showroom and then the original room would be for the up and coming comics. But the uh, established Vegas acts didn't want to play the comedy store because they thought that would ruin their draw like in Vegas. So the main room and the original room all became uh, Mitzi's like regular comedy store players. Um, the only problem is no one was getting paid and you would have comedians like Jay Leno and Letterman, you know, opening for Sammy Davis Jr. in the same size room in Las Vegas and making like $10,000 a week. And then they come back to the same size room uh, in Los Angeles and they'd be making zero dollars. Right. Yeah. So they were like, well, wait a minute. Why? And it is it is kind of a little crazy. It's just like, where were all the money going again? Yeah, it was um, um, Letterman's friend, what's, what's his name, comedian George Miller. There's no receipts at the Motel 3. When you give him the money for the room rent, there's no receipts. Instead, the same guy followed me around night and day. Yeah, he paid. Yeah, he paid. Yeah, he paid. Do you remember him at all? No, I don't. I was trying to, I heard somebody talking about it. I was trying to do, yeah, his mom was the uh, bookkeeper. Yeah, so that was another like kind of uh, slap in the face for the comedians was that George Miller, who was a you know, I, I, he was like Letterman's best friend, like when they were up and coming. But his mom did Mitzi's books, and she was just making bank yeah. off the place. Right. So those guys didn't feel uh, very welcome that they weren't making money. Um, I think one of the uh, what you were talking about when you were talking about the uh, when she was setting up the other the new room, it was a suggestion of uh, a comedian by the name of Argus Hamilton and a friend of his uh, Biff Maynard, who said they said, "Hey, what Mitzi? That you know, if you get the big room sitting there, why don't you put up some of your you know the regulars, or meaning us, the guys who've been sitting around here working our acts, you know, see if we can fill the main room." And that's when she would do the you know you do the rapid fire you know people going up one after another the strip the strip style show and then uh, argus was one of uh, he was supposed to be the the up-and-coming comedian the guy had a he had a pretty good career until the 80s but uh he was a uh, stupid with mitzi at the time as well so that's what he was <laughs> and, uh, and what does stupid mean that means he's boner oh right, but i was, right, I, was right. I was using like comedian talk Stupid. Yeah, no, no, that's yeah. fine. And yeah. if you look at, I checked out like some of his uh, videos, like or stand-up appearances on YouTube. It comedy doesn't age that well. It was kind of like I, I, airline jokes. Yeah, it's I just fly a small this, airline, yeah. a small budget airline. Yeah. We had this. Well, his, he was from Oklahoma, and that was his deal. That was the, what he does. The thing that they tell you to do in comedy stand-up schools: like, talk about where you're from. Yeah, but he was he was on the Tonight Show, like, and, it, and you talk about like you know passing the gatekeeper. He was on the Tonight Show more than twenty times. Yeah, I know. They thought he was going to be, you know, he thought. 
that he was tapped as kind of the next Johnny. Yeah, while. he was yeah. sort of Letterman-ish. It's kind of like, okay, kind of Midwestern. Yeah. I don't know, it's Oklahoma Midwest, but, you know, that's where, like, Johnny was from. Uh, where was he from? Missouri or... Who? Oh, Johnny, Johnny Carson. Yeah I, th- yeah, I think he was a girl in Missouri. Or, or no, he was from Nebraska, I think. Yeah, he was from Nebraska. No, Letterman no. was from Indiana. Yeah. This guy was from Oklahoma. Yeah. But it says here, a little trivia fact, uh... His career was derailed in the 80s by a crippling fondness for cocaine and booze. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> and that all happened to the, the best of them. Yeah, but then it was getting, like, crazy. So Freddie Prince, you know, he got Chico and the Man. Robin Williams got discovered there. Um, and he got, you know, Mork and Mindy. Uh, Jimmy J.J. Walker played the comedy store. And then he was on uh, Good Times. And a smile that lights up the night. And it all belongs to Kid Dynamite! So it came in this part where uh, Mitzi was making so much money off the regulars who weren't getting paid. And, you know, again, it's kind of like like people in comedy clubs just have that mentality of like, you know, you're just lucky to be here and get the stage time, which in some cases is true. But they, it's just like, even to this day, it's just like club owners just take advantage of comedians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and then somebody, well, we'll get into it more later, but let's, we'll talk about power and money. Go ahead. Yeah, you can talk about power and money. We well, can I was always, just going to come into it. With the power later. of editing. I didn't want to, I didn't want to jump into it right now. But yeah, but just when you hear, because basically, you know, after the, the comedians came forward, they said, here's our, you know, here's our demands or here's my request and what, and, and it was pretty, you know, $25 a show. It's pretty, you know. It's not no, it was even like me. just. Can you pay them five dollars for gas money? Yeah, it was even. It's like that, and then it's more. If for her, you can see it's more of a power thing. It's not really even about the money. It's it's about I had this statement, and I'm right. This is a college, and you should be here for free. And like that, you just weren't going to. Somebody wasn't going to budge. Oh my God! Like in New York, there's like I know this. Um, I've heard of this guy who runs kind of like the BC rooms. And well, first of all, there's that whole thing in New York where, okay, uh, you want to get five minutes of stage time, you have to go around Times Square and and try to get people to sell tickets. Right, Mark. Yeah. For free. Yeah. Okay. Or uh, you want to get stage time? Okay, then you have to bring yeah, seven of your paying friends. The bringer shows. Yeah, and we we still won't pay. It. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> but there's one guy, he runs like these BC rooms, uh, uh, and it's not the before Christ rooms. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, they're kind of on the lower end of, of the rooms. And he, um, a friend of mine was telling me he actually has a driver who's an open micer to drive him around. Oh, my God. Yeah, like I tried once to arrange like, uh, you know, because I, I produce shows, like to arrange like a show there. So I met with like his, like, and this is in quotes, his assistant. Who was just an open micer that yeah. he got like as an assistant who he doesn't pay, no. you know? So it's like, even to this day, it's just like, you know, people just take advantage of, I don't necessarily think that's a cross comedy. It's a, it, it's across like people who prey on people's vulnerabilities mm-hmm. and know they can exploit them. Right. Exactly. But so uh, the comedians, they felt they were being exploited. So the, in, ni- in March 1979, uh, the Comedy Store regulars uh, formed kind of a quasi-union called Comedians for Compensation and went on a six-week strike uh, right in front on the Sunset Boulevard. Um, in, and they were led by uh, comedian Tom Dreesen, who was a former like union leader in um, Chicago. You know who have the best names in our society, though, really? Indians have very good names, descriptive names, like Iron Eyes and Running Bear. Imagine if we all had names like that. Hi, I'm Hooknose. <laughs> These are my daughters, Padded Bra and Tinted Hair. Yeah, and Tom, uh, interesting, he has a, he was started up uh, before he was, uh, he was a, te- he was a um, teamster for a while in Chicago, and then uh, when he started doing stand-up, he was part of a comedy duo with Tim Reed. Now, I don't know if you know, if you remember who Tim Reed, but he is probably most famous as Venus Flytrap from WKR. Oh, yeah, 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 so yeah. I remember reading they, this somewhere, and, yeah. and they were like, so Tim Reed's an African-American, and Tom... Yeah. 
Dreesen's a white guy, yeah. and they actually would break. Yeah, they were, they were they were the first biracial comedy team, and they started back in the '60s. And like one of their Dreesen's joke to this day still is they were the first and last biracial comedy team, according to Tom. Dreesen. <laughs> to Tom Dreesen, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they formed a picket line in front of the comedy store, and they had like picket signs that would say things like "No money, no funny," and of course the yuck stops here. But so the news picked up on this, like not only like did the L.A. Times, but like um, like the local news. And they just thought, OK, we'll spin this of an angle. How funny is this? These stand up comedians are picketing on the picket line. So that was like kind of a, you know, like a water skiing squirrel news story <laughs> to them. Yeah, exactly. There was a um, let's see if I can, I'll give his last name pronouncing pronunciation to try. Bill Nodal Sater. Uh, he was the uh, L.A. Times reporter who covered comedy. And, yeah, he said, you know, they kind of started out as kind of the wacky comedians on strike thing. And then he, he – but he was a comedy store regular, so all the comedians, like, knew him and everything. And he said he was there covering the strike, and Elaine Boozer got really mad, came up to him, and she was like, you you know, this is – it's not a joke. You know, this is a real deal because it, it did go on for a few weeks. Right. And what was interesting is when they just, when they decided to do this – when particularly Tom and Jay, who 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 didn't really need the money, right. uh, they they decided to 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 rep, you know uh, ask for money on behalf of the people who weren't making that money, who were living out of their cars and you know eating eating uh, meals at the buffet <laughs> at the bar. You know? Tom Dresden yeah. was one of those people who had been living out of his car. Well, exactly, he remembers. Yeah, exactly. Well, it went on. Well, yeah, I mean, the strike went on for a few weeks, but it was like you know, it went on for years that comedians wouldn't get paid. And Tom Dresden suggested, you know, okay, how about simply this: your cover charge is four fifty. Why don't you just add a dollar to your cover charge, and you split that extra dollar you know, made off of each ticket amongst the comedians. So if you have a couple hundred people in the club on a given night, that meant, you know, $200 to split amongst uh, comedians in 1979 money. So, right, yeah. you know, you could get something to eat or, you know, just pay your gas. Because, like, in L.A., it's like you have to drive everywhere. Yeah, exactly. You know, and if you can't afford you don't have any money, it's not like jumping on a New York subway. It's like, all right, you're kind of trapped, and you drive all the way down to the comedy store, and, uh, and you don't you know, get you're walking gig, away yeah. with no money. Wow. Okay. So just to, uh, I just did some historical calculations here with the the Comedy History 101 computer, um, and so the like you were saying, so the cover price cover price in 1979 for the comedy store was 350, um, which would be that's a uh, it's over 10 bucks. That's about twelve, thirteen dollars today. Yeah, so yeah. that was pretty reasonable. But yeah. you know, comedy clubs make all their money off of drinks. So right, exactly. You, that's you, that's why the two drink minimum and like a drink to make, like even if it's the most expensive drink, would cost the club like actually like you know thirty five cents. Right, and then you've got the two drink minimum tied in there. Yeah. 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 So you know, it's. You're, you're paying some money. So that was, you know, the formula that Mitzi created for the club was uh, with that. But Mitzi came back and just flatly said uh, no. <laughs> right, yeah. She, she was just like, like I said, that was my point. It was all about it was all about control. It was about her. She said something. You know, she made her point. That's how, that's how it is. You guys suck it up. Yeah, so at the time, like, Letterman was uh, starting to come into his own and – he actually guest hosted The Tonight Show in 1979. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How many of you folks here have never been to a TV studio before? Applaud if you've never been to one of these. Okay. How many of you, how many of you have been here before? Applaud if you have been here before. Okay. All right, now how many of you who have never been here before? <laughs> Today are here with somebody who has been here before. Applaud. Okay, now, listen carefully. This gets a little confusing at this point. Huh? How many of you out of that last group are in this country illegally? Could we just hear? Great, fine. And, and, and right after he got done uh, guest hosting The Tonight Show, he would go back in front of the comedy store and join the picket line. And Jay Leno was another guy really instrumental in, in, in the comedy strike. I'm originally from the United States. Any United States people here tonight? 
Yeah, what a small world. Isn't that funny, no matter where you're from? Right. Yeah, he was, um, David Letterman has a really funny story about uh, Jay was very excited about the strike. And during the first meeting they had, <clears throat> he was just like constantly running around the room, getting all excited. And when Dreesen, Letterman had a story where it say, was saying that when, when Dreesen was in front of the room, like, you know, addressing everybody, Le Lena, Leno would hang out behind him and like, like, like he was signing, like he was doing, so everybody would understand what Dresden was saying, you know. <laughs> so it was like, it's like, and David's joke, Letterman's joke was that, okay, the first strike meeting went well. Why don't we just not tell Jay where the second meeting's gonna be? Yeah, it sounded like like Le uh, Leno was like really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> But um, they did receive some accolades, like Bob Hope sent a telegram to Tom Dreesen that said, uh, Dear Tom, uh, congratulations and go get them. So, you know, even like the old school guard was behind, you know, comedians getting paid. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, Let Letterman was all behind it. Richard Lewis was behind it. He, he, he didn't want to pick it at first because, you know, he to him it was – the quote was he he didn't want to say I need your twenty bucks to you know to him that was just kind of trivial, but once you know once he started seeing the big bigger picture that some people were making more money and the artists weren't making any more any money then he was like you know this is bullshit you know let's yeah you know, he was let's, standing let's up for the the comedians that weren't making money right exactly yeah so it was like it was like that watershed year too where you had that whole split where people were you know some people were making a lot of money and there were some people who were still you know working their way up there yeah i mean because basically there was just the tonight show and vegas right yeah and it was before the 80s comedy boom where there was like comedy clubs in every shopping mall mm -hmm. and mitzi said that uh when letterman joined the strike that was the moment that like crushed her because she sort of uh took letterman on early and uh he she would look like when he was like ready to pack it in and move back to Indiana. She was the one that was like, you know, really encouraging to Letterman. Yeah. And when she saw him join the picket line, that's what like really choked her up. I just asked Dave, you've been working at the comedy store. And I said, how's it going? You said, well, you'd be rather be working other places for for real money. Yeah. The comedy store is a yeah. great place to go. You get an audience and you, you work out new right. material. I've been there for three years and. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but after a while, you get the itch to go out and, and earn some dough. So, yeah. uh... And he said, uh, so she called him and, she, and he said, you know, these comedians are my friends and they'll be my friends for the rest of my life. And, you know, she, he just had to stick by the comedians. Yeah. So as the strike went on, they need, you know, eventually they had to try to figure out how to break this thing up. And so our old buddy Argus Hamilton comes back in and he starts negotiating as her representative with the comedians. So his proposal was that they'd pay the comedians $25 a head or per set in the original room. Yeah, but she just said no. What, what does this mean? Argus Hamilton webpage. Oh, I was just brands. saying. But you've got, Is he still around? Yes, he's still around. He does. Uh, he does like corporate gigs and stuff, and you have to go. You have to go look at Oops. his page because it looks All really. Right. Let, let me look, let me look at it right now. Yeah, it looks really bad, but it's been it's updated. It's so. Oh, oh, what is this? It was updated last week, but he's still using frames, which is no. But he's using those bad squiggly yeah. American flag <laughs> gifs. It's, it's like you would think that it's like this really old site, but like look at the like the last news item is from last week. Yeah, copyright uh, <laughs> 2017. Yeah, the last news item actually from it was from Friday. The last yeah. news item on there. So, yeah, <laughs> he just needs Argus. Oh, you're... this is sad. The Argus photo he is... uses is like him from the eighties. I know, dude. Argus, if you're listening, um, we know a couple good ones. Email Argus. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god, and there's like oh, and his photos are just way out of date. Yeah. Oh man, uh, poor guy with his uh, you know, we cocaine and. <laughs> Well, he was a sober. He got sober like right after kind. Of, well, we'll get to that in a little bit. But he got sober, and apparently he's been, he's been sober for a long time. Yeah. So um, as the as the strike dragged on, uh, there were some people that uh, kind of crossed the picket lines. And oh. surprisingly, do you know who one of them was? No, I don't. Tell me. What, what's the other word for these people? What's that? What's the other word for these people? People Strike crossed, breakers, scabs. Yeah, there you go. I wanted to get, I wanted to hear you get ugly. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and one of the scabs was Yakov Smirnov. Oh my God, Yakov. <laughs> Good thing about doing comedy in Russia, you have captured audience. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. But he didn't, um, know, he it, didn't know any better. Yeah, he's like in 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 the U.S. Uh, you pick a <laughs> comedy club, but in Russia, comedy <laughs> club pickets pick you. <laughs> It says my name, Smirnov. Welcome. What a country. Yeah. <laughs> but so Mitzi proposed like uh, a settlement for like the comics to, uh, that she would pay them $25 as a set on the weekends, but the weekends only. And another one of the guys who uh, kind of uh, crossed the picket lines was Gary Shandling. Was I love going to the laundromat because you see people wearing the last thing they want to wear. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> people are wearing Bermuda shorts and a Nehru jacket. And uh, I just don't want to see that. Time. And mm -hmm. Gary came from a family with strong anti-union values. All right, anti-pro-union. No, strong, what does this mean? Strong anti-union views. That's bad. Oh, okay, I mean, so that's... he was against unions. Oh, okay, well then, yeah, then that's not really a surprise then. Yeah, so that was like <laughs> another, that was a moment on, you know, during the six-week strike that was really disheartening to those uh, who were striking because, you know, Shanling was one of the big acts at the time. Mm-hmm. So John Witherspoon was a doorman. He acted as like a marshal on the picket line and protected the strikers from, uh, you know, being harassed by uh, Mitzi's like loyal comedians that would still perform at the club. Yeah. And so what you had somebody who jumped in to uh, help, quote unquote, as one of the as a friend, quote unquote, of the strikers was uh, Bud Friedman, who uh, ran the improv um, down in Melrose, right? It's Melrose. Yeah, so yeah. the improv moved as if, uh, as you might remember from our very first episode of Comedy History Number uh, 101, was the improv moved from New York to L.A. And uh, he positioned himself saying, you know, I will match whatever uh, settlement Mitzi uh, agrees to. So he positioned himself as a friend to the strikers in, in a weird twist uh, during the strike. Uh, the improv uh, burnt down. It caught Ooh. fire. Uh oh, mystery. And they never knew how how what caused it. And and one of the the rumors was that it was a disgruntled uh, person on the strike line that. Oh. Uh, and because of the strike, uh, that's why someone torched the improv. I think it was Jay Leno, maybe. No, I think Jay was there and actually helped like repaint the new uh, oh. improv. If you that remember nice. from that episode, okay, we did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Maybe it was Yakov Smirnoff. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think we made the same joke in the same episode. Oh, did we? I'm, well, I'm, trying, to, I'm yeah. trying to pin this yeah. on... What a country. To, I'm trying to pin this on someone. In the U.S., you torch down <laughs> comedy torch club, club. But in Russia, you. comedy club, club torches, torches you down. <laughs> so uh, when the strike really became ugly was one night... Uh, it, an anti-strike comic tried to drive his car through the picket line, and they wouldn't let him in. And his guy, and his car brushed against some of the comics, and it knocked Jay Leno to the pavement with a loud thud. Ooh. Yeah, so Tom Dreesen ran over, uh, panicked, and to see if like uh, Leno was like seriously injured, and Leno like gave him a wink. Uh, <laughs> and it turned out that he 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 thumped the car with his hand. Okay. Just, but he was uh, still hauled off into hauled off to the hospital and the ambulance afterwards, and that kind of incident seemed to sober everyone up. And within ten minutes uh, of this happening, Mitzi uh, got on the, the phone to Tom Dreesen and said, "Let's settle this thing now." All right. So, do we? One question before we move on. Do we? We don't know who the driver of the car was, huh? Um, I didn't see who, but mm -hmm. I don't think Leno was like really injured, but right. it just kind of. Right showed that okay this thing's like escalating too far and you don't really want you know a comedian getting hurt because you know she was still you know these yeah. were still her comics you know that kind of helped build the comedy store you know like leno and letterman so what was the what was the settlement so on may 4th 1979 a settlement was reached that uh Okay, so the comedians would be paid like $25 per set and new comedians or newcomers, uh, you know, they would work something out. Uh, 
So the performers got 50% of the door in the main room, which is the big comedy room, or $25 a set in the smaller original room. Okay, well, and we're here, according to the Comedy History 101 computer, it's actually not bad. $25 in 1979 is $84 today, so almost 100 bucks for... Doing... Yeah, so anyways, um, one of the big comedy clubs in town is the Comic Strip uh, on Upper... East side, and I think they only pay thirty-five dollars a set. Like right now, in two thousand seventeen <laughs> okay. dollar money. Do you want me to figure that and, out? <laughs> yeah, but even the comedy <laughs> seller is about the same. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, so. Mm -hmm. Well, these are these are showcase cities, you know. So right, yeah. these clubs can get away with that kind of money because, again, it's a showcase format. It's mm -hmm. not like a headliner middle whatever right. it's yeah. like you know you get a lineup of 10 comedians and you know like the comedy sellers lineups are all you know people you know right exactly yeah just going out and seeing so it was pretty good so it was not you know that's not a bad uh 25 bucks isn't bad for 1979 yeah so at least the comics were getting paid but there was some still bitterness uh because of it uh and because of like some comedians that were on the picket line, they just found they would get um, less stage time. Oh, okay. And Mitzi complained that she could no longer afford to keep her rooms running on slow nights, so she would shut down her Westwood comedy room on the weekdays and reduce the number of time slots at the Sunset Club, which meant less work for the comedians. Mm. So what, was there any other uh, negative fallouts to the strike? Uh, you tell me, man. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so kind of the low, the nadir of the strike would be the incident of Steve Lubetkin. Lubetkin? Is that how we're saying it? Yeah, we yeah. could just call him that. I think that was it. We're, no, we're, I'm sorry. The guy is no longer with us. So yes. So we're, respect. I'll, I'll do respect. Dude, yeah. Steve Lubetkin. Uh, he was a New York common, originally started out in New York uh, with Richard Belzer and moved out to L.A. And he was... No, he has Richard Lewis's best friend. Richard Lewis. Richard, Richard, not, Richard Lewis's best friend. And he uh, moved out to um, L.A. to uh, make it big in the business. Um, and so he would start doing uh, uh, stand-up sets. And he, he was doing okay for a while. And then, like, before the strike, he kind of had this... I can't remember who was saying it. It was just, um, uh, it was just an epic string of really bad luck where, like, for one night he had been booked to show on Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show, and they said, hey, you're on, you're, you're great, we're going to do you. And then he was on stage at the store one night and kind of working out a new a new joke where he wasn't doing his, like, you know, set, his, his normal set and just kind of screwing around trying out new material. And one of the scouts from The Tonight Show was in the audience that night that he didn't know about. And the and they just the scout was like you know this guy sucks so they can't wind up canceling canceling that gig he had a couple other gigs where I think one of his he was supposed to be on it was like some variety show and then it got uh, preempted by when Nixon went to China because <laughs> oh cause, really yeah, yeah I never heard that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was like they made a uh, – because it was weird because I was just watching it on that Vietnam special, you know, where they showed the TV clip. But, yeah, it preempted all the news and everything when huh. Nixon said he was going to China. And that's when Lebeckin was about to go up, or he was going up. And so that got cut. And then he was, there was some other, some other variety show he was on that uh, the, the bit just – the whole bit wound up getting cut. So he just had this really crazy string of bad luck. And apparently he had he had scraped together fifteen thousand dollars, and he wrote Rick that he's kind of like a, a pre indie film dude where he scraped together mm -hmm. fifteen thousand dollars. He wrote, directed, and starred in his own indie movie called Dante Shaco, which is which yeah. was never released. And a lot of people are trying to look for. I wonder if there's a copy of it, but I, I saw some people tweeting about it, but nobody can oh, really? seem to yeah nobody can seem to locate this movie because that'd be kind of interesting to see. Which was Richard Lewis in it? I don't know. Might have been. Might be. I didn't see it in the IMDb. So that huh. become uh, that could be. A yeah, whole... yeah. Because I checked out his IMDb, yeah. and all it had was he was a PA on the game show The Smart Alex, right. hosted by Alan Ludden, and David Letterman <laughs> yeah. was a regular on yeah. that. Yeah. So that that was his like his. You know, he kind of bounced around. He was he was kind of doing okay. He was doing pretty well, and then then the strike happened, mm -hmm. and it kind of seemed to push him over over the over the edge. 
this whole, whole lo big long string of bad luck, and then the strike happened, and then obviously, obviously spending putting fifteen thousand dollars into a movie, yeah, it's fifty thousand dollars in today's money, to yeah. put all money into a movie that never gets released. So he he wasn't in probably in the best mental frame of mind, and then the strike came along, and <clears throat> Dreesen kind of put put him in charge, like Wall. Dreesen had to go out of town to do some gigs, and he put um, Lubetkin, Lubetkin in charge while he was gone. And, and um, Lubetkin, some people think that it was too much for him to handle. He couldn't handle everything with what was going on in his life. And he wound up climbing to the top of the um, the Hyatt, the Riot Hyatt, which is right next door to the uh, the comic store, and jumped off the top uh, from the top roof, the top of a 15th story, story building, and landed in the parking lot of the comedy store. Yeah, right, right in the ramp. Yep. Um, but uh, also leading up to that was um, after the strike. Like Mitzi wouldn't put him on right, the yeah, comedy that was, store. That was the thing. I forgot, I forgot to add the part. Yeah, he kept calling, he kept calling, and she wouldn't. Yeah, she wouldn't put him on. And that was to go back what we were talking to about earlier, where there was one, you know, that was the Tonight Show, and that was the yeah. outlet. And if you couldn't get on, you know, if you couldn't get in the comedy store, you couldn't get seen for the Tonight Show. You could, you know, your career was going nowhere. So, you know, you can see how that would might upset somebody. God, like just think how like you know when there was just one show and that was it. And then you think, Oh, all right. Now I'm not at the one club. I know. And that was it. That's like all your options. I know. And the thing is, you know, you know, there are probably, so, I mean, I wish we had some of his comedic comedy that, that uh, we could watch. And obviously if he was friends with other comedians, then he mm -hmm. must not have been really shitty. Cause if he was a really bad comic, you know, people yeah. would, it wouldn't have been. But you got to imagine there must have been some bad comics. The people that just Mitzi liked for some reason that would just go up at the store. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it's curious. weird. <laughs> I'd be curious to see a whole set list from those guys. Well, I also think of like there's these people that were, you know, like your Argus Hamiltons, but like with even less creds that were like the, you know, the club legend. Right. That never made it. And they were like, you know, the huge. I think I remember um, listening to a uh, Pauly Shore interview. Pauly Shore actually gives good interviews. Yeah, yeah, no, he does. He's got, and I think it was like a guy named Ollie Joe Frater or something like that. Uh -huh. Just saying, he, he was like the best club comic I've ever seen, you know, and just never made it, you know? Yeah, and then there were the ones that like, um, yeah, Ollie Joe Prater. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was that was the guy's name. He was a three hundred pound plus bearded Midwesterner, <laughs> and he was uh, friends with like uh, Dice and all those guys. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, but then there were the guys that like kind of made it. Who like I think Marin talks about this. Like looking at you'd see some of the stars. You know, star. You know, they'd have their headshots hanging on the wall. And there was one yeah. guy that I looked up, and his deal was that like he would go on stage with like a lunchbox. I can't remember his name. But it was kind of like a real '70s thing, and I saw. Oh yeah, we talked about yeah. him before. Yeah, I for, yeah, I forgot his name. I saw clips of him on the Dinah Shore show, and it was like that. That is something that doesn't hold up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just comedy that doesn't age well. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. So uh, when 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 uh, Steve uh, Labetkin uh, jumped off into the comedy store um, parking lot, uh, he had he had a suicide note. Uh, that 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 said, my name is Steve Lubitkin. I used to work at the comedy store. Ugh, Not creepy at all. Uh, so uh, the, the the next day, uh, it, it, after the suicide, Mitzi walks into uh, her office and then she saw a poster of Lubitkin propped on her couch with the words "Got the message" scrawled in magic marker <laughs> on her wall. Damn. Like, uh, it was put there by Lebeckin's, uh girlfriend. Dude. And I've heard this story. I've heard this story for several years after on the anniversary of his suicide, someone would go into Mitzi's office and put Steve Lebeckin's, uh headshot on, on her desk. Damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, that's harsh. <laughs> yeah. So basically that was sort of a turning point for both comedy and, and Mitzi, like after that, she just became this hardened sort of club owner. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, that was like the turning point and sort of the aftermath of the strike was, you know, comedians are professional and should be paid. Right. Yeah. And then that's what it's like. Uh, also, you're saying 
where she kind of turned over a lot of the club runnings. I mean, she I'm sure she still kind of helped him with the financial stuff, but as far as like the bookings and and seeing who was going on and who she kind of started turning that over to kind of the comics. Yeah, yeah. So after that, uh, you know, she stopped referring to her club as a school or college, you know, and uh, it was same with like other comedy clubs where, you know, people are making millions. But uh, the reason that the people are there at the establishment are the first place is because of the comedians uh, who should be paid because that's what's really paying you know, the wait staff and the bartenders and, and all that. It's, you know, the comedians that are on stage. So what what, what are the takeaways from uh, the, the comedy store strike of 1979? Pay your comedians. Pay your comedians, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like uh, Elaine Boozer, um, she said she would not go on stage at the comedy store until she was paid first uh, full in cash, and that was all kind of part of the strike yeah, that kind of because I had from friends that ran a an ill fated comedy club back in Austin, the Bad Dog Comedy Club, which was pretty big. I mean, it was that was probably two or three hundred seat. It might have been more. It might have been four hundred seat. It was a pretty big club. But I remember like Margaret Cho was gonna be like their first big headliner, and she like she would not go on stage until they gave her um, a bag full of cash. You know? They'd yeah, say, hey, I mean it those is. kind of fly by. Well, it's probably because like. Um, the club got a reputation yeah. and like maybe a comedian was there and their check bounced mm -hmm. and you don't want to be the guy having to chase down money. And so you book in someone big like Margaret Cho and it's like, all right, but she doesn't want to have her check bounce. So it's like you book me and this is our agreement, you yeah. know, pay me a bag full of money because I don't have the reputation for bouncing checks. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, you know, along the same lines, you had a friend who worked at the rock club in Austin too. And like, they wouldn't like, I think it was Queens of the stone age or someone like they literally wouldn't go on stage until they'd phoned their bank and seen the balance. Yeah. Like into their account. <laughs> so, which, you know, fair enough. It's all that's, 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 you gotta get paid. You gotta get paid. And I, I think, you know, that the repercussions of, of the comedy store strike, you know, led to the comedy boom of the eighties where every place turned into a comedy venue and, and everyone was getting paid, but then it was like oversaturation of, okay, uh, uh, bad performers are getting paid. Bad mm -hmm. comedians are making livings and they're desaturating the quality where back in the comedy store days only, you know, the comedy star regulars were getting paid. Right. Yeah, so um, more comedy, more comics getting paid. Maybe not all good. Yeah, so I think the, <laughs> the takeaway was um, you had kind of coming out of like the 60s and the 70s, you had a bunch of frustrated victims of an outdated structure that banded together because of their values to uh, – uh, make their voices heard of a changing of the guard and redefine the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. Very good. I like that. I like the way that's summed up. Yeah. All right. So uh, how do we wrap things up? Well, here? plug away, dude. Plug away. And, uh... So, yeah, I think that does it for uh, this episode of Comedy History 101. <laughs> Scott, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Um, well, you can go uh, check out our podcast on our website, Words Over Chair. Yep, that's our new website, Words Over Chair, for our production company. You can also find the podcast on all your favorite podcast broadcasting platforms, such as Google Play and iTunes. Uh, we're also popping up in other places like Stitcher. Stitcher. And, yep, Last FM as well. So you can find us there. And you know, the thing is, you know, if, when you listen to a podcast, Harmon, do you, what do you do afterwards? I donate money. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> much like the comedians of 1979 at the Comedy Store, uh, it's it's good to get paid. If you appreciate uh, the podcast uh, uh, and and how much we dig into the history of the Comedy Store and other topics, throw throw in like a dollar or a fiver. Um, it helps us to buy like pens and papers so we can jot down notes to yeah. find out. Uh, and you can do that. You can do that at our site, uh, Words Over Cheer. Words and over that, what I just did, is our, is the bucket speech. That was a good bucket speech. Um, but I also was going to say, in addition to donating, people, you know, if you rate us, that's almost as good as a donation. If you rate us, leave a comment. Hopefully it's good. You know, maybe even a suggestion 
of what you want to hear next over here on Comedy History 101. We also have our Twitter, which is at Words Over Chair. Check us out, tweet at us, say hi to us. And also, we have another podcast that Harmon and I do as well that's called This is the President, where we go over historical presidential speeches, phone calls, press conferences. Believe me, it's a lot more entertaining than it sounds. It's it's like history, <laughs> it's history and presidents all wrapped in one because we, we always uh, compare it to our current president, which is, you know, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong with comedy value on that. Exactly. And once again, uh, thanks for tuning in and like us and rate us on iTunes. Thanks a lot. All right, everyone. Bye. Bye. You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. Good thing about doing comedy in Russia, you have captured the audience. You're stupid. Everybody's so stupid. Comedy History 101.